you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss. Voss. <laughs> she jumped in on me. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. And now you do it, young lady. I don't think it's going to hit me. There you go. Too many buttons to push all at once. Welcome to Big Show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. That'll go on the blooper reel for future shows. As always, we have the most amazing guests on the shows with amazing stories, the great authors, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the astronauts, the CEOs, the billionaires, all the people who bring their stories of life and journeys, share them on you to entertain you and also improve the quality of your life. In the meantime, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Get them in on the action. As our current guest was uh, talking to me before the show in the green room, he goes, you're a very busy man. And we put out two to three shows a weekday, sometimes four, and it's 10 to 15 plus shows a week. If you can't find something to entertain you on this damn show, I man, I don't know what to tell you. You're, you're not listening right. Maybe check your earplugs for weevils or something. Do weevils go into earplugs? I don't know. We'll have a legal check on that. Anyway, goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss One, and Tickety Talkity for the Chris Foss over there. Zenith, man, death, love, and redemption in a Georgia courtroom came out February 20th, 2024 is the new book. And we're going to be talking with the author today about it, but Kraken Poston Jr. is going to be with us on the show. And we're going to be talking about his amazing book and this story that uh, seems like it might be fiction, but as they always say, truth is stranger than fiction. So we'll get into this nuance of the book. Ms. McCracken Poston Jr. is a criminal defense attorney and former state legislator in the Georgia House of Representatives. He gained national attention for his handling of several notable cases that were featured on CNN Presents, Dateline NBC, A&E's American Justice and Forensic Files. He lives in Georgia. Welcome to the show, Mr. McCrack, Mr. Poston. How are you? Thank you. I have to go to two different places that will call to look for my tickets all the time. Do you really? They they get those mixed up? They do. They, you know they, what I keep thinking of is that uh, is that uh, dude with the driver's license. Do you know the movie that I'm McLovin. talking about? McLovin. McLovin. Yeah, McCracken, McLovin. There you go. So give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? Mostly at uh, McCrackenPostonJunior.com uh, is the my, my book site. Mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter, it's at Real Zenith Man. There you go. And then uh, Facebook and the other things, it's McCracken Poston Jr. There you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of this book and what's inside of it. It's a true story mm -hmm. that I think uh, is a cautionary tale about a rush to judgment in a small town. And it's a lot has to do with the time period. In 1999, when this trial happened, there was very little known about adult autism. Mm. I only learned three years ago that my client in the case is indeed autistic. Oh, wow. And that explained so much about the case, about the reason he was seemed suspicious. Mm. Uh, but his very autistic mannerisms were actually used against him at trial. Oh, wow. His flat effect on the 911 call mm. is by his people observing him, a mismatch between the moment and his emotions about uh -huh. the moment. There you go. And then he kept grudges from childhood as it's if they just happened the, that week. <laughs> he was an extremely difficult client yeah. that I had to fight with that. Uh, but then every now and then some really something like a divine intervention would happen. He was obsessed with ancient civil litigation. And I would say, we need to talk about this murder case. And he would say, no, we don't, because I didn't kill her. But the county did take my van. And so that was his logic that I had to fight all the time. Oh, I mean, it must have been a nice van. So there you go. So 
How did you get involved in this case? I mean, I, I think you've alluded that you were the attorney on the case. How did you get involved in this case? It's a small town, and the difference mm -hmm. in small southern towns especially is we know all our eccentrics. We pretty much know them all. Mm -hmm. What we didn't know was that there was a woman in Alvin's house who never came out in almost three decades, and that was his wife. Wow. They, they married in 1966, just three weeks in the same place, mm -hmm. uh, got their license in the same place that Dolly Parton and Carl Dean got their marriage license in Ringgold, Georgia in 1966. Mm -hmm. By the time George Jones and Tammy Wynette renewed their vows in Ringgold, Georgia in 1969, Virginia Ridley had disappeared. Huh. Her uh, family pushed every way. They put articles in the local newspaper, in the Chattanooga, Tennessee newspaper, about their missing married daughter. Ultimately, they were uh, factors behind an eviction, which mm -hmm. ended up in a jury trial. And on September 15, 1970, Mm -hmm. Virginia Ridley made her last public appearance in the Catoosa County courtroom, basically saying, I'm with my husband. That's where I want to be. Wow. Her family, her parents kind of backed off at that point. But 27 mm -hmm. years later, when Virginia turns up dead, her siblings, and I think understandably, revived all of the rumor mills about they thought that uh, Alvin Ridley had kept his wife from being seen by anyone. Ah, so com some control there maybe. But uh, so it, it, it basically turns out, how did they find that she's passed away in his house? He told her, her that uh, he told the 911 operator that what he mm -hmm. called it was she's epileptic. And of course that meant she had epilepsy. Yeah. And uh, she did from childhood. Mm -hmm. She had stopped taking her medicine 20 years before. So she was not medicating, making her vulnerable to that. There was a question at first of why wasn't she taking her medicine? Why didn't she go to the doctor? Why didn't she do all of these things? And they were, these were questions that I was concerned with. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, Alvin was so difficult, he would not let me have access to his house or really? his shuttered Zenith television business that had been shuttered for 15 years. Mm -hmm. He let the police go in both buildings anytime they wanted to and multiple times, but he would not let his lawyer. And so there was just an issue that I had to figure out how to work with him. And it was the div divine intervention again of my parents sending a turkey plate on Thanksgiving and telling me they wanted me to take it to Alvin Ridley. <clears throat> When I showed up with the turkey plate, He would, I realized that he's so transactional that he felt like he needed to give me something. So he invited me into his home. Wow. And so this was Thanksgiving of 1998. And he's free on bail at this time. Is that correct? Oh, yes. He, okay. he, he, he uh, when, when I remind him that I got him out of jail within 24 hours, mm -hmm. he corrects me 26 hours. Whoa, he's a very mean. demanding client. <laughs> so, uh, so when I get access to this house on Thanksgiving, I'm not really prepared. I didn't expect him to invite me in, but I took uh -huh. advantage of the opportunity. Uh -huh. And it, as I adjusted my eyes, it's a very uncomfortable house to be in. Yeah. My eyes started focusing on one wall. And just about every way you could attach paper to a wall, there was a wall covered with writings different oh. types of paper. Oh. And as I focused in on it, I said, Alvin, who wrote this? It seemed to be all in the same, very unique hand. He said, Virginia did. Hmm. Well, it was poetry. It was reports of things going on in the community. It was the cast of the CBS show, The Waltons. It was just all types of just random stream of thought, things hmm. that she wrote down that uh, I, I got too excited, perhaps, because this was the mystery woman, and mm -hmm. I wanted to use this stuff. And Alvin said, it's all I have left of her. You can't use it. Wow, man. So ultimately, I had to pay him $200 to borrow it to make copies for the <laughs> prosecutor with the understanding that we would discuss actually using it later. 
Yeah, and you're you're his attorney trying to say now. How does it end up that they think there's foul play involved and they they put him up? I, I assume for murder. The state of Georgia pathology report. First, the body was delivered to the state crime lab mm. by a local coroner who passed along the local rumor that was unsubstantiated. She said to the state medical examiner, this woman has been locked in a basement for 30 years. And I'm thinking that that influenced his decision. Mm -hmm. He looked at the petechial hemorrhages around the eyes and the lips of the deceased and indicated he thinks that maybe she was strangled or smothered. Huh. And uh, now Alvin that could be from an epileptic a seizure attack. Right? Exactly. Alvin mm. maintained that she had a seizure in the night and that he found her face down. Mm -hmm. And if you're having a seizure and you are face down in the bed, that is one way you can suffocate yourself. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Alvin was difficult. And, yeah. and what I needed was an example of an epilepsy death. And thankfully we don't have as many epilepsy deaths as we used to because of good medication. Mm -hmm. But just interestingly enough and tragically, in September before the January trial, the Olympic track star Florence Griffith Joyner passed away. Mm -hmm. And by October, it came out in the news that she died of a seizure disorder. Mm -hmm. So I got her autopsy to oh. compare it to Virginia Ridley's autopsy. Now, the most famous athlete in the world dying Mm -hmm. And it was a very exacting autopsy because mm -hmm. there was always people that did not want to acknowledge this athlete's sheer greatness, always tried to suggest that there were performance enhancing drugs. Mm -hmm. The only thing in Flojo was Benadryl mm -hmm. and a therapeutic level of Benadryl. Mm -hmm. And, and yet her, the condition of her body was very relevant because that was a first class autopsy. The most famous person in the world. I was comparing it to arguably the least known woman in the world mm -hmm. and her autopsy. And they, the bodies looked alike. The bodies oh, wow. looked the same in wow. terms of particular hemorrhages, tardo spots, etc. There you go. This is wild. This guy is fighting his attorney. He's charging you for stuff. You've got to, you know, barter with him to try and save him from the, you know, potentially death row. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it, it it was not a death sentence, but it, but any sentence would have been a yeah. life sentence for him. Yeah. And it was extremely difficult, as it turned out, only three years ago. And this is what finally made form the book in my head. Mm -hmm. That I learned that my client Alvin is autistic. Mm -hmm. Now there are five and a half million adults with autism mm -hmm. that are undiagnosed, and I guarantee any interaction official interaction that they're having with an investigation or perhaps with a judge, they are not going to be, they're not going to satisfy their inquisitor. Yep. They're going to take literally every question and they're not going to be able to respond to one, a question that isn't literal. And we mm -hmm. speak in riddles sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think of it this way that Alvin was having difficulty processing me, the mm -hmm. investigators, everyone, but we also were having issues in processing him yep. and the way he communicated. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was a, a really a, a just like turning on the light in a room to realize that Alvin is autistic. It explained mm -hmm. his flat effect on the 911 call, which was used against him at trial. Because he was very calm and non-emotional. It explained the, the lack of expected emotion to the moment, mm -hmm. which, you know, it, it, Alvin absorbs the emotion in a room, and he did when my parents died. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a release. There'll be a meltdown at some mm -hmm. point. But it's very much goes with autism. And, and I hope that my book helps perhaps cause police officers to be trained better to screen for that or, or state psychologists or judges. Yeah. I, I, may, I have friends that have autistic kids. They respond differently. They close themselves off. If they get too much stimuli, 
they, you know, they, they're, it varies on the spectrum, but, you know, the responses can be just logical with no emotion or vice versa. I mean, it just depends. And yeah, I could, I could see how there could be people probably on prison or death row that got there because, you know, as you said, it, it's the, it's, you know, not only are we having a hard time understanding, it, they're having a hard time understanding us and everything's lost in the middle. And, and uh, giving them uh, the presumption of suspicion rather than innocence can just make things look awful. So, yeah, it makes me wonder how many people might be in jail over this. Another interesting fact is I brought in the world's biggest expert on sudden death and epilepsy, Dr. Braxton Bryant Wanamaker of Orangeburg, South Carolina, mm-hmm. where just as an aside, uh, after taking him to dinner the night before I put him on the stand, mm-hmm. as an aside, he said, is there anything else unusual about this woman? And I said, I mean, I found what I estimate to be 15,000 entries in this loose leaf journal that wow. went over 30 years. And I said, yeah, she wrote down everything. And he calmly said, that's hypergraphia. That happens in some of my patients, so oh, really? usually temporal lobe epilepsy. And he said, it doesn't affect what she writes. It just tells her to write it down. And it compels her to write it down. And so that was fascinating because she dated some of the writings. Some could be dated by what she talked about. The Mm -hmm. first moon, the first moon landing, the the, the second moon landing, the the presidents. She wrote President Richard M. Nixon about the couple being evicted from public housing. (laughs) He, He responded through the HUD secretary who Hmm. referenced her letter to Richard Nixon. Hmm. She wrote congressmen and senators. They had a, for every ounce of suspicion they had about local government, and they had pounds of suspicion about local government. There was a counterweight of hope from the federal government. It was very unusual. And they were, so they were just two eclectic individuals. Maybe she may have been on the spectrum. I don't know. Uh, But they're just, Two eclectic individuals who like their privacy. They don't like the world messing with them. You know, I like I said, I have lots of autistic friends. They like to do their own thing because, you know, they see us as the abnormal ones. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> They're like, you guys are the ones who who have problems. We're, we're fine. We understand and, what we're doing. And I feel equally <laughs> responsible for the communication problems. Yeah. And, and yeah. even at trial, and by the way, I did not plan on putting Alvin on the stand. Mm -hmm. because I thought how bad would it be that I'm asking him about his wife and he wants to talk about this van that was taken in 1984. (laughs) And so it's a nice van though. I decided I'm not going to put him up. Yeah. And ultimately Jesus appeared to him during lunch one day and he came and told me, he said, Jesus told me you got to put me up. And so who am I going to argue with that? So I tried to prepare him. And by the way, he insisted on keeping the evidence in these giant old suitcases along with the evidence. He brought scores of cockroaches into the courtroom. Oh, geez. It infested the courtroom. The one of the, oh, wow. one of the people on forensic files, the jurors mentions this scene. And the judge finally said, you know, Mr. Poston, we're finishing this trial in the other courthouse in the old courtroom. That was the last place Virginia was seen. 27 years before. And it was oh. eerie going back into the courtroom, the last place she had ever been seen in public. And oh. here are her writings. Mm-hmm. Man, this is a, this has got to go on Dateline and 48 hours, all those, all those shows. Right. I mean, this just sounds like, this just sounds like a hell of a show. <laughs> but it was very frustrating. Yeah. I, I could not, yeah. I did not know at the time what was making Alvin tick. And, yeah. and what was making him so antagonistic toward me. Yeah. And a and you're, lot you're, of it, you're the guy who's fighting for his, his, his freedom. <laughs> and now I realize some of it was my attitude and yeah. my frustration with him yeah. and how he was reacting to it. Maybe you should host uh, things for attorneys on how to identify in law enforcement, how to identify people on the spectrum and, and uh, you know, how, how they maybe don't do the thing, but this, this definitely sounds like a great story in, uh, in all the annals and stuff. Does he end up, uh, do you want to, Jesus, I don't know what happens in the book. I mean, it's technically a real story. So no, I, I don't mind because there's plenty of story in there, but Alvin mm-hmm. was acquitted. There you go. And, and, and I was so thrilled because by the time the trial was ending, 
I was realizing that he is indeed innocent and in fact, yeah. innocent. And uh, it just made me kind of shudder to think of all the people who have not. Now, I think as time goes on, that number of undiagnosed people is going to dwindle because we're catching autism in schools now. Yeah. And either they're being diagnosed in schools or parents are referred for a diagnosis somewhere. And we've had autistic people in our since humanity began. Mm-hmm. And they've been some of our greatest contributors to science and art. And Alvin was a hell of a TV repairman. Yeah. But that was been the picture tube era. Yeah. The solid state circuitry came along about the time that his business failed. Mm-hmm. Uh, TVs were no longer giant pieces of beautiful wooden furniture. That yeah. You had to get a repairman to come to you to fix. Mm-hmm. Now, as he laments, you just throw them away. Alvin will be 82 in a week. Wow. And we go to lunch twice a week, religiously on Mondays <laughs> and Thursdays. Trust me, uh-huh. he's very exact. And uh-huh. I feel let you know if you're late, by I, Absolutely. <laughs> and I feel very fortunate to have him as my friend. There you go. Working on Xena TVs, that echoes, uh, what was the movie Sling Blade? One of my favorite movies. Such great Carl, acting. Carl. Yeah, Carl. Yep, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> He's very it's got much no like, gas in it. He's he's very Carl like. Oh really? Oh, well, there you go. Uh, they the the on the website on the Amazon billing they they bill it as a nonfiction like like nonfiction John Grisham thriller with that goes a Rain Man, Just Mercy, and captivating small town southern settling. But let me just tell you, don't go to John Grisham for a blurb. His <laughs> his, his 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 agent told me off saying oh, wow. don't send stuff to us because people will then accuse us of taking their ideas. And I kind of got it after he told me, Yeah. but at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, ease up, buddy. You yeah. Know? Just calm your yeah, jets this there is, a little this bit. Is, this is nonfiction. It yeah. actually happened. I didn't just spring yeah. from my mind. He writes so many books. I can see that VCs have to do the same thing in Silicon Valley. They won't sign an NDA because, because they get so many different variations of an idea, but yeah. Slinging. The reason I wanted Grisham was mm-hmm. that, like me, he grew mm-hmm. up in the South. Mm-hmm. Like me, he worked on a road crew when he was a teenager in the county. Mm-hmm. Like me, he went to serve in the state legislature. And like me, his first book was nonfiction. Oh, well, there you go. So uh, this is this is interesting. And the man survives. The man lives a unique life. He, his, him and his wife, you know, they don't go out and hang out with other people. I mean, you know, this was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I don't want to hang out with people now. <laughs> I don't like well, going out in public. Virginia much was very much plugged into popular culture as yeah. evidenced by her writings. And and there was a couple of very critical pieces of evidence that mm-hmm. I wasn't sure Alvin was going to bring or allow me to use. Wow. And one, I called it the Rosetta Stone. Because in it, she described the trouble she was having in her fa- with her family, mm-hmm. the fact that she never liked to go out, mm-hmm. and the fact that she spoke to our sheriff. And she mentioned the sheriff that was our sheriff in the 70s. And so that covered a period of time that, you know, we know she wasn't being held captive in the basement. There you go. Man, does she have a sister? I mean, a woman who doesn't want to go out all the time, spend money? I mean, that's... <laughs> It sounds like a gold mine right there for me, you know? I mean, of course, I don't know. Nowadays, they sit home and play and, and bring in everything on Amazon. So well, they, were, they were the perfect couple, as it yeah, turns out. Yeah, sounds like they were a perfect couple. They had a nice life. And, and, you know. and by the way, she wrote in a Bible, September of 1977, God told me today to stop taking my medicine. Huh. In this wonderland of a house are a bunch of empty medicine bottles that we used at trial. Oh, wow. Suddenly in September of 1977, for several months, they are filled medicine bottles. Mm-hmm. So Alvin was still trying to give her and go out and get her the medicine. But oh, she, he's trying to get her to take him. And she, she's like, come she, on, re- and she refused him. to yeah. take him. I had a girlfriend like that. She had, uh, she had uh, Cushing's disease, which is cancer in the pituitary gland. She didn't want to take her medicine. And, uh, and uh, it's like, it's like you're a much better person when you take it, but that's another story. So what is what does he think about this? You you go have lunch with him twice a week. What's his thoughts on the success of this book and 
the story and does does he want to see it maybe on film or tv or does he care by alvin's manner of speech you feel like you're going back to your childhood but just the things that he says and the phrasings that he uses it's it's very it's to me it's like visiting my childhood again and i remembered a moment from my childhood where i had an encounter with alvin i wore the tuner knob off of our tv when i was a kid my sisters and i did Mm -hmm. And my father sends him to the house with a new one. My mother waved him on in the house. I'm about 13. I'm watching live wrestling. And all of a sudden, there's this strange man in my living room holding the TV tuner knob and gives me about a 20-minute instruction on how to change channels on a TV set. Mm -hmm. And But I remembered it because he noticed I was watching live wrestling, and he told me about meeting Andre the Giant. Oh, and wow. he told me what Andre the Giant had for breakfast, as told to him by Andre the Giant, which was outrageous the number of eggs and loaves of bread. Oh. And I remember going and telling all my friends at school that I knew somebody who knew Andre the Giant, and here's what he ate for breakfast. <laughs> During the representation for the murder trial, he tells me the same story. And I said, you're the, you're you're the, the guy. guy. You're the guy that told me this when I was 13 because I became the, you know, wow. the guy that related to Ringgold uh, wow. Junior High. There you go. What a thing in a small Georgia town. This sounds like a very serious version of uh, what was the one with the uh, the Jersey and the little guy, the mafia guy from uh, which we call it. They go to some southern town and, and my cousin uh, Vinny. My cousin Vinny. <laughs> it's like a serious version maybe, of my maybe cousin. Maybe it's an inverse. My cousin. Yeah, Vinny. inverse. Yeah, there you go. There you go. This has been fun to have you on. Give us your dot coms, your final thoughts as people go out, tell them where to buy the book, et cetera, et cetera. The book is on all platforms. Uh, it may be in bookstores as well, but it's on all platforms for ordering. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is the Zenith man with the kissing couple on the cover. That's Alvin and Virginia mm-hmm. in an amusement park photo booth in 1965. Wow. And, and so they used to get out and uh, it's, It's to distinguish it from any other Zenith man that's out there, including one that is our story that Mm -hmm. someone put out as fiction TV repairman with a wife nobody's seen in three decades. Oh, really? So it's kind of frustrating, but I, I, this is the title that I gave New Line Cinema when they were considering a movie about it 20 years ago. And I retained literary rights. uh, Mm. And, 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 uh, you know, there is no copyright in title. So yeah. I, I, I I will credit that author with making me get off my butt to finally <laughs> write this, this story. the story. Truth, the truth comes out. This is make a great movie, man. This is make a great movie, and uh, or yeah, geez, Amazon and uh, there's so many places that make great movies. You know, uh, maybe you can get maybe you can get Billy Bob Thornton to play. I think. <laughs> I mean, he did really yeah. great in uh, what was the Goliath on Amazon? If you ever saw that? No, I haven't. Um, he's such a great actor, but yeah, in Sling Blade, he was just iconic. There you go. I guess I'll have some fries with that. <clears throat> yeah. There you go. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We we'll, we'll certainly appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And thanks, my honest, for tuning in. Order of the book where refined books are sold and check out the amazing story. Say you were able to read it first before they go muck it up on TV or movies or whatever. And I don't know. They add, like, I don't know. They, they always do something with books that, that take them off course. Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in Georgia courtroom out February 20th, 2024. Thanks for joining us for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss one on the TikTok and and Chris Foss, Facebook.com. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. And that should have